Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Today, we are speaking to Michelle Hearn. Michelle is a registered and licensed dietitian with 11 years of experience as a clinical acute care dietitian, lead dietitian in psychiatric care, and outpatient dietitian. While practicing inpatient and outpatient care in the hospital setting, Michelle discovered a disheartening connection between the high carbohydrate, low fat, quote unquote, sugar in moderation, nutrition guidelines she was required to teach, and the rapidly declining health of her patients. Michelle believes in food addiction, which makes her an outlier in her field. At a young age, Michelle was diagnosed with anorexia and was treated with what she shares today was an IV medical refeeding, basically straight liquid sugar via a tube through her nose down into her stomach. She was told and believed that she would have to live the rest of her life suffering with this complicated relationship with food. Later in her life, she became an endurance athlete. In 2019, Michelle decided to follow a low-carb, high-fat, high-animal protein diet to see if it would alleviate severe muscle pain she was experiencing. Not only was her muscle pain gone in a matter of weeks, her decades of anxiety began to fade. After years of struggling with anorexia, she also discovered that eating this way helped alleviate some of her eating disorder symptoms. As a dietitian, she found herself in the dietitian's dilemma, what to do with her new knowledge of recovery in the face of information she was expected to teach her clients, to eat addictive, refined carbs in moderation. So Michelle wrote the book, The Dietitian's Dilemma. In it, she details how the current nutrition guidelines came into existence and advocates a low-carbohydrate, animal-based way of eating as an option for individuals struggling with diabetes, mental disorders, eating disorders, and heart disease. Today, she shares her experience working in the field and trying to shake things up at low-carb events. Like Michelle, Molly and I have found that a lot of individuals we work with struggle with both eating disorders and food addiction. So we have created a group specifically for you, full of peers, a community to support you, and us to help guide you along. We do a one-hour group coaching session on Mondays at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The link for the group is on our podcast website, www.foodjunkiespodcast.com. This is another great informative episode. Enjoy the show. Well, thank you again so much, Michelle, for being here today with us on the Food Junkies podcast. Let's just jump right in. And, and we're just curious to know if you're willing to share, will you give us your personal story. And um, how did you get to where you are today? What was your aha moment? All the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'll try to give you the reader's digest version. So, um, you know, my health journey basically began when I was 12. When I was 12, I was diagnosed with anorexia. I was about five feet tall and 57 pounds. So I was in inpatient treatment for two months, you know, immediately put on the standard American diet, um, fed a 24 hour tube feeding system, you know, the tube feed ingredients, Back then were maltodextrin, corn syrup, soy protein, and canola oil. The two feed ingredients today are maltodextrin, <laughs> corn syrup, same thing 25 years later, um, you know, put on seven different medications. I was told I was just, hey, you know what? I did become weight restored, but I was told that you're, you're probably going to have problems your whole life with food. You may have racing thoughts around food, anxiety, all, all these issues. So even as a young person, I was kind of having to be mentally prepared that, okay, I'm just going to have to become a high functioning, anxious eating disorder person. And, um, so yeah, I went through school. I decided to become a dietitian because you just, you kind of want to know like what is going on in my body. Is there anything I can do to where I'm not going to have these racing thoughts? Is, Is this really like my destiny? Right. And as I became a dietitian, uh, you know, you go get your four year degree and you get into an internship. There were just things in the internship that didn't really make sense. Like, for example, we would go see a patient with severe diabetes and my preceptor would say, okay, we're going to 
put them on a diet where they eat 75 grams of carbs per meal and seven or 15 for snack. And I was like, well, wait, I thought they had high blood sugar. Well, yeah. Well, shouldn't they eat less carbs? Oh no, no, no. They need carbs. Everyone needs lots of carbs. So we'll just, we'll teach them that and then teach them how to manage it with insulin. And I was like, I remember being like, oh, but you know, you're new, you're a student. And then as, as I alluded to, um, you know, went to the ICU and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, people in traumatic car accidents or major cancers and getting fed the same two feeding that I got fed is the same today, you know, these, these very processed ingredients. And I would just ask, I was like, Hey, is this the best way to refeed somebody with, uh, you know, major <laughs> health issues that can't take in any food. And I was told like, look, it's just calories, calories in, calories out. It doesn't really matter where they're coming from. And so after I became a dietitian, I just, you know, I didn't, I didn't see a lot of my patients get better. You know, I worked in acute care and you just kind of kept seeing the cycle. Patients keep coming back. Diabetes is worse. Kidney failure is worse. Um, often in the hospital setting, we're told that it's, it's not our fault. It's the patient's fault. It's just, they're not doing what we tell them to do. They're not eating whole grains. They're not eating fruits and vegetables. And interestingly, for the most part, I found my patients were really trying to do like what we were telling them to do. And, uh, you know, which makes you start to question, like, I, maybe these guidelines aren't right, but you know, I just wasn't ever educated on alternatives. You know, there's this dogma for dietitians that like, you have to, you know, you have to have whole grains and certainly in the eating disorder community, you know, you, you know, you will know you're well when you can eat all foods and moderate them. You know, so many people have believed that, they're not well, they're never going to be well because they continue to struggle um, moderating processed foods. And so my big aha moment in 2019, I was actually, I'm a distance runner. I was training to try to qualify for the Olympic trials and the marathon. I had run a 254 at that time. You needed to run under 248. And I, all of a sudden my body stopped recovering well. And, you know, you do the like, oh, maybe I didn't sleep. Maybe you eat more. And like, it was weeks of a lot of like muscle pain and weird aches and not sleeping well. And, you know, lab test didn't show anything useful. Um, I noticed my anxiety got worse and uh, two sports dietitians told me I needed to eat more carbohydrates. And at that time I was eating about 350 grams a day, like a more bread, more pasta, more sugar. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'm in, let's do it. And as you can imagine, that went from bad to worse, you know, I, where I had been, you know, at that time running 10 to 15 miles a day, I'd go out for a two mile run and get like cold sweats. And finally at a particular day, I tried to run, I couldn't went to the hospital, really just tough patient day, had a patient pass away. I, I covered oncology as well and came home and like fell asleep, like on the couch at like two in the afternoon, woke up in the middle of the night and it just felt like my body was on fire. Everything hurt. And I just remember sitting there thinking like, I'm out of solutions. Like I've taken over the counter stuff. I've taken some harder stuff. I've taken some alcohol. Like I don't know what to do. And I got up, went to 7-Eleven and bought like 30 pounds of ice and put it in the bathtub. <laughs> and so I'm just sitting, you know, in an ice bath at like three in the morning, crying. You know, my wife came in and was like, you know, maybe we should do something different. And I, at that point I was like, yes, we will. We're done. Like I'm done. Not, not me, not me and her. I'm done. Like I'm done running. You know, I thought like, this is ridiculous. I'm physically broken. I'm mentally exhausted. I'm having all kinds of racing thoughts. I mean, I was worthless at work. I was showered at home, like things in my life were terrible. And at that point, I just kind of decided like, I'm never going to run again. And the next few days I, I was like, well, if I'm not going to run, why not reduce my carbs? It's crazy. Cause like I intuitively knew all these carbohydrates were not making me feel well, but I had just been told so many times over my, as a young person, as someone recovering from an eating disorder, as someone who became a dietitian, that you need these things. They are essential. You will die without these things. And then you talk about fat or saturated fat or a ketogenic diet. It's almost a bad word in many dietetics communities, although it's, you know, it's getting better, certainly in the, like the, you know, the space. So I was almost I was scared. I decided, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to follow a ketogenic diet. And then I kind of stumbled on the carnivore diet. And I just thought, you know, what if I just did this for 30 days? Like I have literally nothing to lose. My health is a mess. It's not, <laughs> I didn't believe it could get much worse. And of course, you know, I told my wife, I said, I, this is what I want to do. And she was like, Absolutely not. <laughs> like, this is eating disorder. This is terrible. This will only set you back. And I like kind of outlined it. I was like, look, this is not a low calorie way of eating. Like I'm clearly, you know, I need, I, I just felt like I just need this. I need the protein. I need the fat. And we argued, we fought, she cried. And finally she was like, whatever, you're an adult, you know? 
And, you know, <laughs> fast forward, of course, like the first week I had like the worst headache of my life. Um, didn't know about electrolytes. You know, she's like, how's it going? I'm like, it's great. <laughs> um, but I knew, noticed right away that my muscles felt better. Like I'm not in pain anymore. And then it was like, oh, I'm not running. But then I noticed it work. Like I wasn't always thinking about food. I wasn't staring at the clock. I didn't have to, I wasn't carrying snacks. You know, I didn't have to like, when I ate my breakfast, like my meat and fat, which was of course, you know, a bunch of dietitians, everyone's eating bagels and bananas. And I'm here with my pound of beef. We're like, oh, that's different. I noticed, I just started to notice things. I felt calmer. I felt more at ease. And then about the third weekend, when I got home from work, my wife was sitting on the couch and, uh, you know, said, come here. I need to talk to you. I was like, oh my goodness. Like, okay, what's going on? And she said, Hey, I don't know if I like this way of eating yet, but this is the best your anxiety has been in the 11 years that I've known you. And that was while we were just like, Whoa, like, and she was right. You know, I was sleeping. I was happy. I was calm. And so that's when we were like, okay, I'm going to find every single scientific paper, anecdotal thing, like, you know, and of course, naively at that point, I thought, wow, maybe I can change my, you know, hospital and bring this in, bring, you know, cause there's so many, I had no idea. There were so many published studies on low carbohydrate diets specifically for diabetes, but of course, you know, the system's like, uh, uh-uh, you're not, <laughs> but that's how it started my journey and started me, um, becoming angry to some degree with healthcare. I'm like, I've been, I've been anxious for decades and I like can reverse it or feel 90% better in weeks. And that's when I decided I would write a book. I would, um, you know, just kind of see, kind of see where this journey goes, went, see if I could connect with others. And, um, I also was able to start running again, you know, it's something I thought would, would never happen. So I'm just, I'm grateful. I'm hopeful, you know, for the, for the future. And I'm also, you know, just honored to be sharing my story. So I'm interested to know in your opinion, do you feel like eating disorder or do you identify as eating disorder? Or maybe there was some level of carbohydrate addiction. Do you believe in food addiction? Like what are your thoughts around those issues? Yeah. I mean, I personally don't identify as like, I wouldn't tell someone like I'm anorexic. I'd say, you know, I I suffered from anorexia um, because I don't feel like, (laughs) I mean, I guess you could get real scientific about it. I certainly don't fit the DSM five with all the, the symptoms, but I, I definitely felt like for most of my life, like if you had asked me in 2019, I would have been like, oh yeah, I'm a recovering anorexic. I think about food every goddamn day, all the time. It's constantly running through my head. Should I, should I not, you know, but I don't feel that way anymore. I, I absolutely believe in food addiction. And, you know, early on in my dietetics career, I was told it did not exist. I was told it was an excuse for people to overeat. People are lazy. And so I was really grateful for the work of specifically of like George E, um, psychiatrist, Chris Palmer that really broke it down on like a neurochemical level and some of the clinical trials we have around um, food addiction now. I mean, you know, I mean, it, I, most people can tell you, I mean, you carbohydrates, you know, certainly from just a biophysiological standpoint, like what happens in our body, you know, from the getting the blood sugar rush and insulin crash, you know, blood sugar rush and crash from insulin, the human body does not regulate processed carbohydrates well. And then what they can potentially do to the brain, you know, we know for some people, well, first of all, you know, food companies engineer these foods to, to be very, very, very ultra processed, but I did not know that they can actually, you know, shift neurotransmitters in your brain. Like most people are like, oh yeah, you get that dopamine rush. You feel better when you eat a lot of sugar or flour, which is true. But over time, it can actually shift the neurotransmitter glutamate very high. And what does that do? We actually see high levels of glutamate in um, people with certain psychiatric conditions and suicide victims. But what that does is it's... Uh, suppresses neuroplasticity. It basically, for, for kind of layman's terms, when you eat a lot of sugar and flour, it can actually prevent the brain from being able to cope with stress. It can also prevent the brain from being able to, to mold and to change. So what ridiculousness then in, in recovery and in treatment centers that we're doing all this cognitive behavioral therapy and we're trying to teach you how to change your behavior, but we're feeding food that prevents your brain from being able to take in that information. And then we put the blame back on the patient, right? So it's this never ending cycle. So, you know, things that I have discussed is that, Hey, you know, why don't we remove these foods? And that's an incredibly controversial thing because the thought and the dogma, and it makes sense, like just on a very basic level, like, well, Hey, if someone has problems with food, if someone's restricting or binging, purging, like we can't tell them not to eat something because that might further exacerbate the problem. If you just like hear that, you can kind of be like, oh, maybe that's true. But you have to think about what does food, what does it do on a not on a biological in your body and in your brain? 
And if certain foods, and I even say like, we shouldn't even call things food, you know, um, like to me, Oreos, grandpa, that's not food, you know, apples, meat, like that's food, food, you know, (laughs) but if these certain things are actually changing my brain chemistry to where it's going to set me up to binge, it's going to set me up to be anxious. It's going to prevent me from healing. Then, you know, to me, that's, that's not food. That's a foreign substance that I probably shouldn't put in my body. Yeah. As you were saying that, I think of my six-year-old who often like, you know, she's at that age where definitely wants to push boundaries and get her way, but she will say to me, I prefer sugar, you know, and I think she's using my words against me because she knows, she knows what I do, but, but she will, she'll pick a peanut butter and jelly sandwich over, you know, a piece of meat kind of deal. Like if we're, you know, we're, we're, if she had the choice for dinner. And so I think about that, you know, that, uh, back in the, when they were much younger, you know, the whole, I was inundated with fed is best was always kind of the message. And, and sometimes I think that we, even as adults start doing that, like fed is best, but we have to use our higher order thinking. We have to use our rational brain. And I get that the food is getting in the way or the food, like things are getting in the way those products are getting in the way. But certainly if we start to think about that, an apple and a steak are completely different from like you were saying, like Oreos and a bagel. Mm-hmm. So yeah, no, I appreciate, I just appreciate that you started advocate, you know, you, you were in there, you were in that system and you were advocating something's got to be different. So for people who don't understand, because I think I run into this a lot with my clients and, and Clarissa, I think you do too. I often get the question, but how do I know that this isn't eating disorder or how would I know if this is food addiction and not binge eating disorder? So how do you distinguish the two or, or how would you from your from your professional perspective? Yeah. You know, that's a great question. And I mean, you could certainly, you could certainly go back to like the DSM five, like, does it meet these things? But I guess like, you know, one of my first thoughts when you asked me that is I want to only say like, does it, does it matter that much? Like one is a problem and they're both major problems. Like if I have binge eating disorder, you know, I'm significantly, you know, overeating. Certainly if I have a food addiction, you know, there I'm eating things that are going to trigger me to be unable to stop, you know? So However, however it breaks down, you ideally want to get to a place to where you're able to eat food in a way to where you're, you're not thinking about food. You know, I heard something the other day that said, how many, how many seconds have you lost in your life thinking about food? What if we put all those seconds, minutes, hours, days, in my case, probably years into doing something great, something you like, you know? And so you know, kind of how I, how I like to structure that is I, I do think it matters like what you, you know, what you eat. Cause certainly we have tons of evidence. There's even a great a clinical study, a year long study on three different people with binge eating disorder, lifelong binge eating disorder and had remission on a ketogenic diet. So we can show certainly when we feed you enough fat, when we feed you enough, you know, adequate protein, and we really reduce your total carbohydrates that we're healing your brain, stabilizing your blood sugar, not feeling hungry too, you know, so many things. Somebody asked me earlier, like, how do you know when you're, you're doing okay, you're feeling good. It's like, like I said earlier, I'm not thinking about food. You know, it's not, it's uh, I'm sleeping. When I, when I go to bed and I wake up, I feel more recovered. My body feels good. You know, those are great things. I'm having steady bowel movements and in general, my, my attitude is pretty positive, you know? So those, all those things are things that um, I feel like I'm getting away from the original question, but <laughs> binge eating disorder versus a, uh, yeah. How would somebody maybe start to like, if, like, are there some questions that they could ask themselves or are there things that they could look out for that would help them to determine if it could be one or the other? Sure. Sure. You know, um, often too, is like how you talk about food, I think is really interesting. And I see this a lot. Um, when you say, <laughs> I'll give you an example. So I, first time I was suspended, I've been suspended twice in the hospital setting. I had a patient who was very young. I want to say in her mid thirties and had severe kidney failure, was morbidly obese. And I looked at her labs. I was like, my goodness, you know, and I went to talk to her, I introduced myself. So my name is Michelle. I'm the dietitian. And she said, let me stop you right there. You know, I would rather die than give up cake. And I said, well, ma'am, you're on your way. And I, I mean, she freaked out, told her nurse. And I mean, I was literally ready. I was like, look, I mean, her labs, the more morbidity and mortality rate are high. I wasn't lying. I wasn't being mean. This is, this is where she's headed. But it was like, you can't talk to someone like that. You know, heaven forbid we, you have to coddle all our patients, right? So how do you talk about food? You know, when people say, I would, I could never give up bread. I would die without sugar. Take away my caffeine and I'll cut your throat. Like, I mean, seriously, this is something that people have said to me. Like, how do you talk about that? You know, 
also, when are you eating? Are you eating? Do you eat a lot by yourself in secret? Are you eating because you're actually hungry? Are you really sad? Does, you know, and sometimes I say before, you know, people always ask me like, what's the best advice? Tell me something nutritional. What's the first thing you want to do? And I always say it, radical honesty is first. You need to sit with yourself. We don't do this enough as a culture in general. I mean, in my perfect Michelle world, we'd all start 10 minutes a day, just kind of sitting, being quiet. How am I doing? But when I, you know, was in the bath at three in the morning crying, I am, um, you know, kind of a come to Jesus moment. Like my life is not good. My health is bad. I hurt everywhere. I'm short with my wife who's the most important person in my life. I yelled at my dog today, you know, like I hate my job. Like sometimes we need those like moments, right? Of like get real with yourself. So when you're thinking about like, do I have a problem? Do I have an addiction? I think just kind of sitting with yourself. I think often, you know, you can get real. And I mean, it hurts. And this isn't like a, oh, I suck. I'm a loser. No, this is just real. Like, man, I, I didn't go to the party because I was afraid I was going to go eat or I could not wait to get out of that party because as soon as I got home, I, you know, I went through the drive through and got a bunch of fast food. So like just kind of getting real with it is kind of how you start. And it's, and it's, I always tell people like, take away the shame. <laughs> you would not believe how many people have, have, we all have stuff. Every single human. I got lots of stuff. We all have stuff. You will not meet a human on the space of this planet, you know, that doesn't have issues, struggles, whatever. So just, you know, being really honest with yourself is kind of where, where I like to start. So how do you think, like you already said, you know, certain people will come in and they want like, you know, to speak to you specifically, okay, well, this food plan works for me. We were talking about this before and people needing to have that specific food plan. And how do you think that like diet culture plays into that? And, you know, how can people get an appropriate food plan? Do they need an appropriate food plan. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because I used to have people like send me like, you know, DMs and emails, like, do you do meal plans? Can I, can you send me a meal plan? And it's like, <laughs> what an easy way to make money. Like, sure. Just, you know, it, but it wouldn't, it would not work. And I, there's a big difference between like, here, are, here are some concepts, but when you get down to a food plan, you know, specific food plans, like the human body, it's not a calculator. It's not like, and, and that's why I think some of the my fitness pal stuff, you know, can be so arbitrary because it's not like, wow, I ate 2000 calories today. It's great. Or I'm going to lose weight anyway. That's not how the human body works. You know, it's not this, we, we know that it has so much more to do with, um, you know, hormones and all different components and how different foods have different impacts. You know, obviously, you know, 200 calories of butter has a different impact than 200 calories of Coca Cola, Right. So, you know, kind of how I like to do it. And anytime I work with somebody, it's like, we're going to talk about, you know, what are your goals and where you're at, you know, and I can certainly teach you some basic concepts that I think apply to most humans being that I, I feel like, uh, most people, you know, don't get nearly enough fat. you know, they have all these fat phobias, fat, you know, I'm scared, um, can be very addicted to sugar and to carbohydrates. I saw a meme that said, you know, <laughs> if you, if you need breakfast to be a religious experience, we need to talk about your diet and you know, people so much sugar and ah, it's just like, ah, I see Jesus, like, you know, my frappuccino. And it's true. So I think we need to, as opposed to having me tell you, like, you need this much protein, this much fat, this, whatever we need to, I would rather work with you and figure out kind of like what, and also what kind of what works for your schedule and what works for your life to some degree, but also teaching you and empowering you to be able to do that yourself, because you know what, you're 99% more likely to do it. If you kind of came up with it, like I can kind of walk you there. But like, if I just said, you know, arbitrarily, like, okay, you're going to have, you know, this for breakfast, this for lunch, this for dinner. Like, what if you have that for breakfast and you're like, Oh, I still feel hungry. Like, Oh, does Michelle know what she did? She know what she's talking about? Crap. Lunch was terrible. But what if, you know, I said, well, here's a general idea. I want you to sit. If you're still hungry, I want you to eat a little more. Like I'm teaching you how to uh, like learn your own body signals, how to respect that. And that takes time too, you know, especially people are funny. They're like, man, I've been messing up for 20 years, fix it in one meal plan. You know, it's going to take some time to relearn, but certainly by making sure you get enough fat, enough protein, in my opinion, many people can do just fine with some whole food carbohydrates, you know, certainly if it's um, specific and strategic and, you know, that that's how I do things. But I think, man, it's this really slippery slope. I think a lot of people have, when you're looking for something outside of yourself to fix your problem, I mean, that's a problem in itself too. Um, a meal plan will fix my binge eating disorder. A you know, this, this course I paid for will make me feel better. It's like, no, you it's, it's a lot deeper than that. Like you're really going to have to fix it yourself. And yes, of course, certainly understanding the general concepts of nutrition and certainly applying those, 
but it's um there's no specific meal plan that uh <laughs> sorry sorry people that's gonna and it's not gonna work and then it won't even work for you at the same time like let's say mirror miraculously you know you something i did for somebody was working you know how i eat today is different than how i eat in 2020 and it evolves i'm an athlete it evolves on my training it can evolve on stress it can evolve on jobs and what if i had a meal plan i'm like oh god i'm still hungry but my meal plan says i'm done eating or maybe I'm not that hungry, you know? So getting able, being able to, for food to just be one more thing in your life, like, Oh, I ate, I'm hungry. I'm, you know, I'm I'm full now I'm good. Move on versus this kind of obsession with following a certain plan or even a perfect macros, I think is, um, is a little silly. Can I just ask you quickly how you help individuals you work with learn that body trust of hunger and, you know, fullness? those signals, because there's definitely a lot of people listening who, and definitely clients, both Molly and I work with that. They just, they have no idea what that's supposed to feel like, what, how long this process might take, you know, of course it's bio-individual, but are there some guides or just even hints that they may be able to look for or seek in beginning this process? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that the best thing you can do is definitely like if you can, and this, and I'm not even great at this, but if you can sit for 20 minutes while you're eating, you know, cause we're just often, you know, running around doing a million different things, sitting, you drive in your car or whatever you want to get out of that fight or flight response. And as in America, we live in the fight or flight response. So it's like, Oh my God, I've got to get my kids to work. Ah, I mean, I'm eating. And it's like, was I hungry? Was I not? Uh, did I? And it's so easy to overeat because your body is constantly thinking that we're chasing a tiger, right? It's so you also need to be digesting food prop- properly. I would imagine most people in our culture don't digest. So, you know, I really encourage people before you eat, take two minutes, you know, people are like, oh, I don't have time. Yeah. You have two minutes. If you're on Instagram, if you're on any social media, you got two minutes, get off social media for two minutes, set your phone and do some box breathing, breathe in four, hold four, breathe out. And you can YouTube different breathing, just breathe. That's telling my body I'm safe. I'm calm, ready to eat. So then, you know, eating your meal, if you can, you know, while it's quiet, while whatever can be really helpful that I think, you know, people just get more in touch also like tasting the food. I mean, I was totally guilty of just about like, oh, I gotta get to work and you're just <laughs> as quickly as possible. And I will come back to, I do really encourage fat, you know, encourage fat for a lot of people, a lot of women I worked with have just really restricted fat, um, eating a lot of, you know, sugars and flours. And it's, that is one thing that is um, to some degree a little bit harder to read on just because it really, you get really full, really satiated. So I encourage that, you know, and I also uh, encourage people to honor circadian rhythms. I think that really helps trying to get in the morning, get some light. You know, I usually eat, uh, eat a lot of my protein in the evening just because, you know, it can be a bit harder to digest, but you're going to be going to bed, going to be sleeping. So focusing more around some healthy fats during the day, um, you know, and for me, I have carbohydrates around when I'm active in training, but for people, you know, I really encourage, uh, you know, small amounts of carbohydrates, maybe when you're kind of more active or you're doing more active stuff. So yeah, that's how, that's kind of how I structure stuff. Yeah. Thanks for that. Because I was going to ask, you know, how is what you do with, with folks different than intuitive eating, but you just laid it out beautifully because it's very different, but I think people (laughs) hearing this hear us saying things like honor, honor what your body's telling you. And that sounds a lot like intuitive eating when yeah. what we're really talking about is mindful eating and mindful and, eating. Yes. And, well, and you just, your body. I don't believe you can, um, intuitively eat processed carbohydrates. Like that is one thing that the, um, you know, and I I've read that book. Um, and I think, I think the concept, I mean, once again, that general concept sounds so great. Right. And I don't think they were totally far away with just the general idea. Cause yes, we want to be able to eat and be like, Oh, I feel good. I'm full. But when you have people like, and I mean, it is literally, it is people's full-time job to make these processed foods created in labs with chemicals to make them as addictive as possible, to make them as easy to overeat as possible. And I, it actually, I kind of think it's sick that in their marketing, they, they, they market it that way. Once you pop, you can't stop, you know, bet you can't eat just one. Like they are literally telling you, we, we have made this to where good luck, you know, like, <laughs> so yes, like that's the difference is I feel like intuitive eating and certainly in the eating disorder realm, it's like, Oh, you should be able to eat one cookie or one cupcake or one, whatever. Um, you know, once again, I don't necessarily consider those things food, where when you are eating fat and protein and, um, you know, some whole food carbs, the over time, you know, your body will definitely be able to tell you like, yeah, this is good. I feel like good. I had enough, you know? 
Yeah. So thinking about all of that and, and really hearing how you work with clients, which I mean, sounds like you said, like really low carb or keto is low carb is keto. Are they just another diet contributing to diet culture? Or do you think that there's something different about that? Those ways of eating, those ways of eating that kind of smashes diet culture in some way. (laughs) Well, yeah, you talk to most traditional dietitians and they, they, you say keto and you're like, they have a heart attack. You know, they think it's just the worst thing in the world. But like, as I said earlier, that was the way of eating that they, um, you know, utilized for the study, the clinical trial with people with binge eating disorder. So, you know, I mean, we have shown ketogenic diets have shown so many different things. I mean, they just had a study with Alzheimer's that said like a ketogenic diet, you know, positively impacted their, you know, ability to, um, do the like lifestyle, <laughs> like if a pill did that, you've been all over the news, it'd be bottled and sold, you know? And from what I, you know, studying evolution and studying how humans evolved, like most, you know, certainly early humans were very low carb, you know, you ate a lot of meat and fat, you ate, you know, little tubers and vegetables and things that were seasonal. Uh, so no, I mean, I certainly don't believe it's a fad and we've seen, you know, we know, and we have clinical trials that you can start to reverse diabetes in as little as 14 days on a very low carbohydrate diet. Um, you'll see in the, you know, very low carb or carnivore communities, people can be very emphatic, like it needs to be zero carb. It needs to be only meat. And that's a little silly, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't need to be that. And, uh, and it, once again, it kind of depends on your lifestyle. Like for me, someone who's very active. I mean, I can eat 150 grams of carbs and make ketosis, right? Like, so there's, there's, there's some nuances there, but we have seen, um, just so much healing that can happen when we remove a lot of the, you know, especially the ultra processed carbohydrates. And, you know, we know for people specifically with eating disorders or anorexia, you know, um, <laughs> it's so interesting to me that it just like, almost seems like common sense. But I put, when I presented this not too long ago, I mean, I showed a clinical trial Yes, people with anorexia actually have GI damage. Like, what do you know? You starved yourself. Your your gut's messed up, right? But so, the, you know, proposing the question, like, is the best way to refeed this person a diet very high in flours and sugars? Is that going to make them heal? Also, we know that the white and gray matter of the brain atrophy during a lot of weight loss. So when we refeed you, you know, the standard American diet. Now you rebuilt the brain on those types of fats. How do you think that's going to work out long-term? So certainly suggesting that we have somebody follow a very high fat, you know, high meat, low fiber, let's not irritate your irritated gut diet for a select period of time seems to make sense to me. You know, you're providing enough calories. You're also providing a slew of the B vitamins, you know, of all the essential um, amino acids, essential fatty acids, you know, oh, that's another thing that we don't get enough of, in my opinion, you know, very absorbable vitamin D, E, A, and K. So no, I, you know, a long way of saying, I do not think it's a fad. I think it has its place. Um, and I do think you can build out from it. I don't think you have to be like, oh, I'm only going to be 25 carb, but maybe you have more, maybe you have less. Maybe there's, you know, times in your life, you do things a little bit differently but I've seen a lot of success and a lot more studies on, you know, those whole food, low carbohydrate diets. Yeah. I certainly think it's like a medical intervention for physical and mental health. Absolutely. Absolutely. More than a diet. So we've also, we ask every guest, because this is a phenomenon that we are seeing in our field. We work specifically with individuals who go off sugar flour, and then maybe they switch to volume. And so, you know, they're, you know, maybe weighing and measuring their meals with protein, carbs, and healthy fats, but they still want or need more. They crave more. Doesn't matter that these are foods that usually produce like a shutoff right? Some fats Mm -hmm. and they have that satiation signal. And for like the individuals we're working with report that they don't have that. And I was just curious if you've seen that phenomenon or if you may have any, you know, advice about how individuals can help manage some of this. We certainly have spoke to the mindful eating too already, which is a great tool, but yeah, just curious as your thoughts on that. Yeah. So, you know, I haven't dealt with that a lot. I do know one particular individual who suffered with that quite a bit and, um, you know, talked back and forth with her a little bit, kind of getting her thoughts and and feedback on that. And I feel like just with anything else, sometimes, you know, it is very, with any eating disorder, we often see like you you kind of trade disorders. So it's like, okay, I used to binge eat and now I compulsively drink or compulsively gamble. I can do something else. Because, and so for me, you know, when I think about that, 
I think about there is a lack of a coping skill here. Like I am substituting one thing for another. And once again, this is not blame. This is not shame. There's nothing wrong with you. This is just what's going on in your life. And so like, you know, if you notice like, gosh, it's great. I'm off sugar and flour, but now, now I can't stop eating in general. Then, you know, you might be somebody for a little while that has to be, you know, a little bit more mindful. Like, okay, I set out this, I know this is enough for me. And then when I'm done, I'm going to do something else, you know? And then over time, like I, I truly believe the body wants to get back to homeostasis. I mean, the body, I, I truly believe, and I've seen, you know, the body and the brain has tremendous capacity to heal. But I also think that, um, you know, sometimes you just need to do something else. You know, you need to break that cycle. Like, okay, instead of a reading, you know, when I was done, I, maybe I set a timer, like 15 minutes. Now I go for a walk. Now I pet my dog. Now I do something else. You know, because um, we also know, you know, the brain, when you wire the brain, those, those never go away, right? So we, we have to create new pathways. And, you know, it's for, I always think about it. It's like walking a trail. You know, if you're like, if you always walked to this trail and you've never walked to that other trail, that trail you walked, it's like, oh, it's flat and it's easy. I, I know how to go that way, right? And this other one has branches and it looks kind of brambly. I don't know if I want, but you'll know, see so you kind of like rough through it the first time. Well, after, if you just keep doing it, you know, it's like, yeah, that trail's been by, you know, several weeks, months in, you're like that, I can walk that trail easily. And you look back on that the first trail and you can still see it. It's there, but now that trail's brambly, you know, now that trail is hard to get through. So that's what you really want to get to, you know, you're getting that time on task, you're getting that consistency. And I can't speak to, um, will it, will it ever be go away? Probably not, but you know, hopefully it'll be easier to where it doesn't like negatively impact your life or just, you know, be something that you're constantly thinking about. Yeah. I think that's great. Uh, a great visual for, for listeners, but also like great, just advice. I mean, because we do, we often see the volume piece of it and we talk about it being a lot like addiction, whack-a-mole, just, <laughs> it is yeah, it's just like, oh, here it comes again, <laughs> just in another way. And it's just information, right? It's just information that something still requires some attention. Something's not fully healed, something, you know, whatever. And so I really, I really appreciate the visual that you just gave us. Okay. So we're going to switch gears just a little bit because we really are interested in um, your professional perspective on this as well. Um, can you tell us about the nutritional guidelines? Like where do they come from? How, how are those created and how can we change them? This is we a need whole to chapter in my book. Like it's <laughs> wild. Like it is bizarre. Like I, I knew it was like, most people would probably say like, okay, well, we know it's kind of corporate, but like how they came to be is, is total nuts. So um, the Reader's Digest version is it really started with religion, it started with, you know, this woman, Ellen White, who thought she had a vision from God and eating meat was bad. And so she started this school, this medical evan- uh, evangelical, I'm going to say that wrong, but, um, and she, they taught, they taught people under, you know, <laughs> under their, under the roof, they taught dietitians, you know, this was in the um, late 1800s. And then, you know, fast forward to, um, you know, during the war, World War II. We, you know, first the U.S. was like, ah, we're not getting involved with this. So there's, but they wanted to grow crops for our allies. And so, you know, we started to um, subsidize corn and wheat, and then we got involved in the war. And it's like, okay, well now we really need to subsidize this. And then they, so farmers made a lot of money and they actually tried to rescind some of those subsidies. And some of them were still around today. The farmers were like, ah, this isn't, you know, going anywhere. So we had a lot more grains and a lot more, you know, things than we had ever had on hand. Um, but back then, you know, people, you still had full fat milk, all the, all the real fat stuff, you know, the, the whole actual products. And it's just, it's just like this crazy cycle of things that happened and, you know, keep, keep going fast forward to sixties and seventies. We started to be a little bit concerned about like heart disease. You know, we had people having more heart issues, heart attacks, and then we had Ansel Keys, who was considered the first nutritional scientist. He did what was called, I want to say like the 14 country study, but he only, he only used things that fit his hypothesis. Like he basically left out a lot of the country, the countries that consume the most animal fat actually had the least heart disease, but his, his hypothesis was the more animal fat you eat, the more heart disease you have. But when he didn't see that, he just didn't posted half of his research. And so America was like, oh my gosh, like fat is fat bad. Should we be eating less fat? Oh my gosh, we're kind of freaking out. Then at the same time, you know, we had President Nixon was in the office and we had Vietnam going on and he wanted to be reelected and food prices were really high. And so he was like, well, crap, what do we do? And like, well, let's reduce food prices, you know? So once again, he hired this guy, his name's Earl Butts, 
can't make that name up. And he was like, well, let's subsidize farms. Let's have them corn, more corn. Everybody get corn, corn, corn. So they grew corn and then corn started being added to things in the seventies. We had corn oil. We were, instead of tallow, we started frying things in corn oil. Corn was added to cereals, everything. But then it was like, how oh, we have so much corn. Like we had too much corn. And so Earl flew over to Japan to where they had this new technology. Um, they could turn corn into a sticky, gooey substance that was cheaper than sugar, tasted just like sugar. And the birth of high fructose corn syrup came. High fructose corn syrup also stable. It was a shelf stabilizer. So within years, things that never had high fructose corn syrup, meats, everything had, had it. And so now we had, you know, fear of fats. We had all this sugar added to things. All the fat was being removed from products and they're, you know, adding more sugar. And then of course, like, you know, the government and all their wisdom was like, oh, we've got to make these guidelines. And, you know, they were actually initially concerned about, about poverty. Like, okay, you know, we had people in poverty. They made the, uh, the food stamp system that really, that actually helped bring people out of poverty. But now we also had this crisis of like, oh my gosh, people are getting really overweight and obese. <laughs> what do we do about it? So, you know, they uh, published guidelines and of course, food processors and manufacturers were very happy to assist them in that. And you had the basis of the guidelines, lots of grains, little meat, little fruit and vegetables. And, you know, you can see a graph of when the guidelines are actually published to now, and it's just obesity and diabetes has skyrocketed. You know, we are eating less fat than we ever have as a nation. I mean, specifically less animal fat, a lot more oil, a lot more like seed oils, a lot more carbs and flowers and our health is just just a mess. You know, every chronic disease is off the chart, you know, diabetes, uh, heart failure, depression leads our nation as the number one cause of disability. And, um, you know, it's interesting because I, I looked at the 2000, um, 2020, 2025 guidelines and they look pretty damn similar to the ones before. They actually, if you, uh, it's, it's like a 64 page document. They use the word healthy. I want to say like 510 times, but it's the same thing. You know, it's the same eat in moderation, you know, high carb, low fat. It's, it's not, I don't believe things will change on a very like government level anytime soon. Why do I believe, oh, Michelle, are you just a curmudgeon? No, because, you know, we live in a capitalist society and you make a lot of money keeping people sick. In the hospital setting, if I heal you, I lose you as a customer. Like for diabetes, you know, if, if you're, if you're reverse your diabetes, then I don't get, you know, how am I supposed to, you know, my, you do diabetic surgery. How am I supposed to amputate your leg? You know, we can't heal people. We, you can't kill them or heal. I kill you. I lose you as a customer. I heal you. I lose you as a customer. I have to keep you perpetually sick. And that's a sad, hard truth that I think a lot of people like really need to kind of wrap their arms around. So, but yeah, the nutrition guidelines, it's such a mess. And, you know, the Academy of Nutrition, it used to be called the American Dietetics Association. When I became a dietitian was sponsored by Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Frito-Lay, I mean, as of this year, 2021, you can't make this up. They're literally sponsored by the National Confectionery Association. I was like, we are sponsored by candy. Like, come on. I mean, and also that's very hard to find. Like, you know, people like show me, you have to like log in your whatever. It's, it's not like they're not advertising that, you know, but it's, it's really sad and it's really backwards and it's got a lot of people confused, you know? So yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to change anytime soon. So maybe it's not about changing it so much as it's about ignoring it as noise <laughs> and doing what's right for us and our individuality, whether that be more meat, more veg, more fat, maybe it's more vegetarian, maybe it's more carnivore, wherever you fall on that spectrum, however you feel the best, like you were saying before, like it's going to change depending on needs, but maybe that's more the answer. I don't know. I mean, what is your... What is your take on that? Like, what should we do about that? Should we be paying attention to the guidelines? Should we be trying to change them? Or should we say nuts to that? Do what you do this <laughs> well, instead. Yeah. We need people like Nina Teichold and Doug Reynolds, like people that are really advocating for change. Like that woman has been hardcore advocating for change. But, you know, I, I got to sit with Doug Reynolds, who was at the meeting trying to change policy. And he said I, they were literally scribbling on a pad when I was like presenting my case. Like they weren't, I mean, they weren't, they didn't give a shit. Like they had already made it up. And I, I know, and it's not, it's common knowledge now that many of the people on those boards are also heavily invested in like Coca-Cola and other things. So, so I'm, I don't necessarily want to say we don't need people in policy. That's not my thing. Y'all, whoever wants to do that, good Godspeed. <laughs> but what I, what I think we all can do on an individual level is, yeah, is to really ignore that and say like, that's just propaganda. Like that, 
that doesn't work, you know, and just step back and use your common sense, you know, like is, you know, take a product like cereal. It's supposed to be part of this complete breakfast. Like if I was making breakfast for my child, would I be fine taking a thing of flour and putting in a blender with a thing of sugar with canola oil, throw a vitamin pill in and dump like, you know, artificial colors. Like I would never do that gross, but that's lucky charms, you know? <laughs> like, so just kind of using some of your own common sense. And then I think using like, what does the human body need? Like we know the human body runs really well and really efficiently on, you know, fat. Um, we need some essential amino acids, you know, so getting protein and then using carbohydrates to tolerance. Like in that, I think if we get back to that. It's really, it doesn't have to be overly complicated. You know, and we also are eating like real foods. It's amazing to me that that's such like a strange concept. Like people think if you don't eat things that are in a package, then you're weird. <laughs> you know, it's like, right. no, my health is actually way better when I don't eat like, you know, highly processed nonsense and just kind of being okay with that. Like, I don't know. I, I, I guess, cause I've been kind of in this space for a while. I'm, I'm really okay with that. You know, <laughs> some people still think that's weird. Yeah. It's like, if we eat real food, we're being too restrictive right? Yeah. That's the messaging. So yeah, you wrote, yeah. You wrote the book, Sorry. The Dietitian oh, yes. Dilemma. And in this, you know, you speak about your personal experience in working in this field and having different feelings, you know, what you spoke about being suspended twice, like what happens to dietitians if they offer like low carb or no sugar food plans? You wouldn't be able to do it in a, a hospital setting. Like, I mean, what I was told, like it could literally, I mean, be a problem like with insurance, you know, like you could, the hospital could literally get in trouble. Um, you could, you know, top down, it would be that, that big of a deal. Like Jayco could come and shut it down. Like you, you literally can't like you're, you could get fired. You could have your license, you know, and, but certainly in private practice, you know, I'm encouraged to see people say like, you know what, I'm just going to do this on the side. Screw you guys. <laughs> That's incredibly hard to do. You know, like it's hard to start your own business and do things like this. And sometimes like you even have to practice as a nutritionist, like, and depending on what state you live in, you know, even if you have your full RD credentials, because it's not cheap to become an RD, you know, between your internship and your education and all that stuff. So, so yeah, so it's, and also you have just this years of dogma, so, you know, sometimes it's, there's something called cognitive dissonance. Like if, oh my God, if I believe this evidence, then all the advice that I've been giving to people for years has been hurting people. And I, some people it's easier just to be like, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to face that, you know? Um, but yeah, RDs are, are really um, not allowed. Like you could get in big trouble for doing that. Like let the fire and suspended, just depending on your, your hospital regulations. So Right. And you work for a hospital. So what kind of happened in your personal situation once you <laughs> got suspended? Like what, what did you end up doing with that? Yeah. So I, you know, right around when all this was going down, I, you know, I was actually supposed to even get my own floor and this was in early 2020 and then COVID happened. And then all of a sudden there were no more elective surgeries. We, you know, and I was on the, I was newer to the, to the hospital. And so it was like, okay, you know, we're going to cut your hours. And I was already kind of <laughs> irritated with the system. Like, all right. Oh, but Michelle, okay. We're going to put you in the call center. Like, don't worry. We're going to make sure you get hours. I was like, well, what, what do you mean the call center? They're like, oh, that's where patients, cause we had a room service system. That's where they're going to call in and order food. And you don't do any dietetic work. You just have to plug in their orders. So for eight hours a day, you're going to have people on diabetics call you and order chocolate cake and caramel macchiatos. And you just plug it in, it, you know, heart disease will give them as many carbs as they want. As long as they don't have salt, that didn't last very long. And I was also, you're not allowed to talk, tell people stuff, but you know, people would be like, well, what should I have? I'm like, oh, I'd fast. Like, this is all nonsense, you know? And, and then I would get in trouble. So so that was a point, you know, that's when every free moment I had, I was writing my book, you know, my hours were already cut. I hated the call center. And then I, you know, telling my wife, like, I got to find something else. I don't care what it is. I don't care how much of it. So, you know, we're like redoing our financials, like, okay. And cause I have dietitians reach out to me all the time and they're like, I'm stuck. Like I need this job. And so I, I empathize with you. Like I hear you. And so finally our financials got to a point that I was like, okay, I can take something making a lot less money. And, but then also the, you know, once again, COVID, a lot of people are losing their jobs, but there was a, a place in Portland, Oregon, that was like a <laughs> breaking down animals, making sausages, looking for an entry level. And I was like, Oh, pick me. I'll do it. Like, let, you know, and it was very healing because then that was kind of the beginning of my carnivore journey. And I was eating a lot of meat. And so I got to be, meet a lot of farmers and I got to, you know, work with meat and, 
it felt good to be in a, go from a position where I felt like as a dietitian, I was just giving mind numbing, not helpful advice to like, I'm just working, I'm working with my hands and I'm doing something I feel good about. And so, you know, I've done that for a few seasons now. I enjoy it. I do it very part-time now. So I got a lot of other stuff going on, but I still go back uh, every, it's seasonal, seasonal work. And so, yeah, I mean, that's what I did. And um, I'm, I'm fortunate, you know, that I've been able to, to publish the book and do a few other things. So I got a few irons in the fire now. So would you ever go back to the field? If they allowed me to teach, yes. That would be the only thing. I mean, because I get asked because I'm on some Indeed list and they'll call me once a month, you know, for something. And man, I tell you, it's hard because there was one position that was like, you would just have to go there once a week and they were going to pay you an astronomical amount of money. And it was like, I was like, can I, can I actually teach though? Can I teach what we're, no, no, you have to teach the carb counting for diabetes. I'm like, I can't do it. And once again, this is no judgment. If somebody's in a position where they need this money or they need it, well, like once you see it, you can't unsee it, you know? Like I, I was, there are times I would tell friends, like, man, I wish I had no conscience. Like if you just didn't have like a heart or conscience, because it's like Coca-Cola, they pay tons of money for their dietitians. But it's, um, you know, life certainly isn't all about making money. Life's about doing things that, you know, chasing your passion. Like that's, that's what I tell people. Like the only thing I want to do is chase, chase my passions in life and then help other people because my health has been restored. So it's kind of my gift of gratitude. And, you know, as long as I can do that. And of course, you know, you have to be able to afford to rent other stuff then that's, that's what I'm going to keep doing. So what is next for you? Oh my goodness. I feel like there's all (laughs) on an athletic standpoint, you know, I'm a, I'm a ultra runner. I'm, I'm training for a race June 11th. I've got a a 62 mile race (laughs) um, um, in the gorge in the Portland, Oregon. Uh, So that I'm really excited about. That's actually taking up quite a bit of my time right now. I probably am not going to write another book. That was a, hopefully I never have that much free time. It was a wonderful process, but it's a lot too. You know, I am going to be at KetoCon. So in Austin, Texas, I'll be there. And then I will be at Low Carb USA in San Diego. And then we'll see, we'll see what else happens uh, from there. You know, I still do, I do the nutrition consults through the ketogenic lifestyle coaching. And we currently have a puppy that is six and a half months old. <laughs> so, we also, so Jackson is wonderful and uh, time consuming as well. So. so where is the best place for our listeners to find you? Yeah, you know, I'm very active on Instagram. It's um, at run, eat, meet, repeat. Um, you can even send me an email directly to my personal email through there. Um, I try to get back to DMs, um, you know, put on so, me and my wife do a few funny videos on there, but try to do some, you know, nutrition education things on there as well. I also have a website, the dietitians dilemma.net. And then my book, the dietitians dilemma is on, um, Amazon. We have a paperback, a Kindle and the audible. All right. Well, we have a signature question, so I'm going to try to make it a, a little more tailored to you too. Um, okay. so we typically would ask if you could tell a younger version of yourself, something about food addiction, what would it be? But I would also like to include, you know, recovery and low carb keto carnivore. I mean, I would like to just kind of include if you could just go back in time and tell little Michelle something, or, or even just a few years ago, Michelle, something, you know, what would that be? Oh man, I almost got a little emotional thinking about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think the thing that would have been most helpful to my teenage self, um, to my younger self, to my self who, you know, relapsed quite a bit in my, my early teens and adolescence would have been like, there is hope, there is peace. There's a really beautiful life on the other side of this, you know? And I would never sit here and say like, wow, my life is perfect and I never struggle, but it's night and day compared to what it was, you know, I was, I was convinced, like I'd lived with, you know, eating disordered thoughts, tendencies, behaviors, racing thoughts, um, 20 years, 20 plus years. So I would tell you like, <laughs> hang in there. <laughs> it's going to get a lot better and a lot easier. You're going to have some wonderful people in your life that are really going to support you, you know? And then if you, you know, trust the process, I've been very lucky and grateful that I've, you know, reached out for help quite a bit in my, my life and my adolescence. And so, yeah, that, you know, you don't, you're not going to be bound by those chains. You know, sometimes even when I'm running, I think about how, when I was, I was literally in chains. I mean, eating disorders, food addiction, Euro, it it will control every aspect of your life. So there is life beyond that. There will be a time that you can eat and won't even think about it. You know, there will be a time when you, you know, you'll be hanging out with someone. You're going to just be able to focus on what you're doing. You're going to be able to be actively involved. I feel like for so much of my life, I was just on the sideline, 
I was there, but I wasn't mentally there. I was thinking about food or something else, you know? So I think that would have made me happy and excited. Like, oh, just knowing that there is a day that food isn't going to run my life. So yes, that's definitely what I would say. Thank you so much, Michelle, for being here. And thank you. That was such a hopeful, inspiring message. And I know like I appreciated it so much. I imagine (laughs) all everyone who's listening just loved it as well. Well, thank you guys. Thank you so much for having me on. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.